Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, we will to start today's uh, web class. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Sayada and uh, Dr. Mega who helped me in uh, preparing this presentation for today. And this is the most basic thing that we should all know about uh, barium studies being radiologists. So what, uh, and I'm sure that most of the centers at least uh, procedures like uh, follow through or something are all uh, in the dwindling numbers. So we are only left with maybe barium swallows and enema sometimes. But it's important to know they still have their own uh, place in the diagnosis. So in this view, we have uh, chosen this topic. And uh, we also got a feedback that uh, these are the topics that are not covered in uh, uh, many colleges where the exposure is not that much, in, especially in uh, barium studies. So that's the reason that we have taken this uh, chapter today. So welcome all. And again, I request everyone to kindly ensure that their videos are not running. Yeah, let's start. Yeah, can anyone tell me uh, what are these three images? If there are three different types of images, you can just uh, type in the chat box. What are these three images? I'm watching the chat box. You can just try attempt. What are these three images? Yeah, definitely. They are all barium swallow images, isopicograms. I, I agree, but uh, what is the difference between the three? Yeah, someone is messaging telling that it's not audible. I would request uh, everyone to ensure that uh, if, uh, for some reason it's not audible, just ensure that your speakers are uh, on, right? The speaker icon is not muted and you have chosen the call via device audio setting. Yeah, what uh, I wanted to suggest was the all the three images here or of barium esophagogram, uh, part of barium swallow. Um, but the difference is, you, if you see the first one, you can see some linear longitudinal lines here, correct? So these are very obvious in this, not seen in same patient, not seen in this particular. So this is a mucosal release relief film. The center one is a single contrast film of the esophagus, and the third one is a double contrast film of the esophagus. Yeah, correct. So the, the first one is a mucosal relief, the second one is single contrast, and third one is double contrast. See, uh, so there are basically these three types of uh, images that we can acquire in any top, uh, type of barium procedure. So in mucosal relief films, usually a thick uh, barium is made to be swallowed if it is a swallow procedure. And once the barium has uh, passed through the uh, area of interest, it is just viewed. Once it is emptied, the, uh, the area of interest is emptied, we can view a lumen being partially collapsed and we can def see the, we can see the folds better. Okay, so the mucosal relief films are very best for visualization of the folds and also the, any submucosal lesions, which are not that obvious in the other two. And if you see the second image, it's a single contrast image. The uh, lumen is uniformly, uh, it is uniformly uh, opacified. So we cannot make out any, uh, the mucosal pattern or the folds or anything. So this is a single contrast film that we generally do to assess the, maybe the level of obstruction or some physiology like the, whether the swallowing taking place correctly, if there is any uh, the G reflux, uh, to assess the level of obstruction in the suspected intestinal obstruction, right? So, and we can also make out any large uh, lesions or ulcers, not the smaller ones, in the single contrast. And the double contrast where we have air also and uh, mucosa coated with the thick barium, uh, this is best for uh, visualizing mucosal, um, subtle mucosal changes and also lesions like ulcers, polyps, right? So these are the three types that we talk about, uh, three different type of images, okay? And these are applicable in all, all the barium, for all the barium studies, not only swallow. 
so let's go to the next so this is the same thing that i was telling so these are three types of images and uh, we need to know about them so you even in exams or uh, in a procedures we should be try, trying to do all this uh, 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 types of images and uh, we should know what to interpret in what type of image so basically when a patient is uh, we do a barium procedure we have to analyze the images in these headings one is the anatomy what we are trying to image the second one is the functional assessment whether the motility is correct a functional assessment like uh, if, it, if it is barium swallow we can actually assess whether the swallowing is taking place correctly okay so there are different phases of swallowing so you can see the in the initial o phase which is called the oral phase we can see no barium is entering into the oropharynx because the base of the tongue and the soft palate are approximated to each other and then when you actually swallow and it goes into the uh, oropharynx and uh, so then the epiglottis tries to close the larynx and the soft palate tries to close the nasopharynx so all these things can be seen so it's a functional assessment uh, so th this is in barium swallow similarly we can assess the type of peristalsis so whether the peristalsis is taking place correctly or if there is any hindrance what are the types of peristalsis that is taking place okay so that is in uh, again in swallow or uh, follow through uh, and also one more thing is what we call as intestinal transit so the transit how much time is it uh, taking the uh, is it taking for the barium bolus uh, to go from the stomach uh, to the ileocecal junction so even that is part of the assessment functional assessment so these are the few things that we can see when it comes to motility and definitely the caliber caliber so we can identify we have to comment on what is the caliber of the intestine or the bubble that we are talking about so is it uh, grossly distended is it collapsed okay so that will give us an idea of what could be the pathology and finally the lesions and also the folds we may have to comment on the mucosal folds so just for an example uh, as far as anatomy barium swallow i told you we have to actually assess the assessment starts from the oral phase right from the mouth okay but what images i am showing are much below so so you can just uh, see the valaculae in the lateral and the ap film right it's a double contrast uh, swallow barium swallow and we can also see the piriform sinuses so the reason that i am showing these images is uh, we, sh we need to know our anatomy correctly before we actually go and do the procedure so there is a soft palate here and uh, we should be able to assess where is the epiglottis what are these are epiglottic folds we should know the anatomy before we actually go ahead and for interpretation of the images so so it, can anyone guess what is this a simple uh, image right so very simple image you can just type in your uh, findings or just the diagnosis if you know in the chat box anyone okay uh, any other response yeah this is again another importance uh, image showing the importance of knowing our anatomy pretty well right so here is a uh, stomach filled with barium and then there is the pylorus of the stomach then there is the first part of duodenum and we expect the duodenum to be c shaped right and cross across the midline correct but unfortunately what is happening here is all this small bubble loops are on the right side of the uh abdomen right or in the right side of the abdomen itself so this is a case of mid gut malrotation so as everyone most of you suggested so this is the importance of knowing our anatomy pretty well so if we don't know that the duodenal jejunal junction is supposed to be on the left side correct what is the location can anyone guess what what would be the ideal location for a duodenal jejunal flexure landmark yeah it is the l2 upper surface of the l2 vertebra just on the left of the vertebra okay so there is an l2 vertebra so this is possibly the l2 vertebra and 
as it comes and joins it at the level of S2 vertebra, you will find it on the left side. Okay, that is very important. So, uh, so diurnal jejunal junction. So I can just tell you in the next image, it's showing that, right? So this is just a graphical depiction showing the diurnum, and then there is a uh, DJ junction on the left side of just to the left of the vertebral body L2. Okay, at the superior margin. So this is very important to know. So these are some examples, just some examples of just quoting what the importance of knowing anatomy. Yeah, this is another image. So this is a, a small bowel barium study, correct? What we rightly call as follow through. So what we can see here is clearly, right? That this is the left upper quadrant showing small bowel loops distended with barium. And they have folds, right? You can see these folds, which are which are numerous when compared to the bowel loops in the right lower quadrant. So this is how we try and differentiate which one is the ileum, which one is the jejunum. Uh, this is very much helpful, especially if there is any malrotation, to just identify which one is the jejunal loop or which one is ileal loop, and also to identify, uh, especially malabsorption syndromes, whether there is something called jejunization or ileization. So all those things. Uh, in celiac screw. So the jejunum will always have more number of folds, prominent folds, right? As compared to the ileum, which is almost foldless, which is less, uh, and especially the distal ileum uh, may not have any folds at all. Yeah, I would just request some of you to just uh, help those people who are uh, typing in uh, that they are not able to hear the audio, they just help them out with the type, the, typing the chat box, what all they could do, just like they have to select the call via audio device, right? And uh, they have to ensure that their speakers are not muted, such things. Okay, please uh, help them out as we continue. So the left upper quadrant, uh, so there, is, there are uh, bowel loops which are closely placed, spaced uh, folds. And as compared to these, these are the ileal loops and these are the jejunal loops. So we should know how to differentiate ileal loop from the jejunal loop. So that is another point as, uh, as far as the anatomy is concerned. Yeah, what could be this? Any guesses? Again, an easier one. You can just type in your uh, findings. What could be this? As I again request everyone to ensure that their videos are not running, they have muted their videos. Kindly stop your respective videos so that it's not a distraction. Yeah, can anyone just type in? Yeah, I get a response that it could be in the pyriform sinus of growth. Okay, right side. I don't know why it's the right side, fine. Yeah, what's happening here is, this is the level of valicula, V is depicted. So valicula are just adjacent to each other, unlike the pyriform sinuses, which are, which are widely separated, okay? so. This is in the valicula. There is a ill-defined, irregular, uh, you can call it a filling defect or a growth uh, in the valicula, possibly from the base of the tongue. Yeah, correct. So that's, it could be either a valicular growth. Uh, it could be a valicular growth or it could be a growth from the base of the tongue uh, going into the valicula. So we should know an anatomy well to identify this first as a valicula, okay? So, and uh, very important is to understand that uh, the procedures have to be done correctly. Otherwise, uh, many a times we may miss uh, identifying the pyriform sinuses, valiculae, all the stuff. Another important thing as regards to anatomy is when you, when we actually do a barium procedure, uh, there are two surfaces, okay, especially the patient is supine. So the posterior part of the colon, the posterior wall of the colon or the intestines will be dependent. That means they will have a barium filled pools, right? Like this, these are dependent areas and the non-dependent areas, especially in double contrast studies, will be have only a small thin coating of barium overlying it. So we should be able to identify which one is the dependent and which one is the non-dependent areas of the intestine to actually characterize lesions. So this is another important thing we should know. And one, okay. So, yeah, then, as I was telling that that was the anatomy part, now we got come to some physiology functional aspects. So there are many phases of, this is an example, just an example, swallowing, okay? So I think one image is missing here. 
yeah yeah we get that image so initially what is happening is the the patient starts to swallow you can just see this is a pharyngogram phase almost so it goes in and uh, gradually peristalsis starts right once the barium goes in the peristalsis start in a proximal to distal directions okay and gradually there is emptying of the barium so this is how normally a peristaltic wave goes and when uh, the, the first peristaltic waves that actually start because of the barium entering when you when the barium enters and which goes from proximal to distal are called primary contractions and once the uh, lumen is distended with barium there are secondary contractions that are very similar to primary ones that just try to empty so even that is a, a propulsive type of peristaltic wave so the primary and the secondary contractions are which are physiological so that we usually see we have to try and assess them that's the importance of fluoroscopy a spot image will not may not help in this fluoroscopy will definitely tell us so what is this yeah you can type and just let me know what could this be yeah this is uh, something called diffuse esophageal spasm or tertiary in simple terms uh, tertiary contractions right which are of non propulsive type so they are not they are of no use uh, when it comes to actually uh, uh, taking the foot along or the barium column along so they are just irregular they are the there are contractions at multiple places at the same time which is of no use actually so these are abnormal contractions so this is another way of identifying uh, corks through esophagus right correct this diffuse esophageal spasm cork through esophagus they're almost all they're all the same so we have to try and identify the pattern of peristalsis otherwise uh, and these are the advantages of barium which we will not be able to make out on a ct or an mr okay so that's the importance so we have to do a functional assessment in terms of the movements and the uh, peristalsis so again this is the cork screw so just to tell you yeah what is this another easy one very easy one right so this is i think mbbs level uh, images yeah that this is achalasia correct so again another problem of uh, peristalsis so the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax in uh, response to the dilated uh, lower esophagus so that is what is achalasia cardia so that is how we identify uh, what we need to identify is there is gradual tapering okay it's a gradual tapering of the distal esophagus right and a barium pool the pooled barium proximal to it in the distended uh, esophagus and uh, yeah there are few very small contractions not so much visible that is correct so so this is how the, this is again assessment of functional part of it and again there is another thing that i, I don't have a image as of now the gastroesophageal reflux so again uh, the barium study is much superior as compared to uh, the other modalities of imaging to identify gastroesophageal reflux because uh, it is a we can take a cine loops and just check and uh, when it comes to gastroesophageal reflux uh, there are various uh, maneuvers that we can do like uh, the putting the patient in prone position right elevated the elevating the limbs and doing valve salva maneuver and all that stuff uh, just to ensure that uh, we don't miss out any gastroesophageal reflux next is the caliber of the bowel so it's a uh, this is this rule is uh, by and large uh, standard so in barium studies there is a small difference between between the ct enterography or enterocolysis and barium studies when it comes to the bowel caliber just check it out for ct and mr in the other uh, uh, textbooks but this is uh, the, uh, by and large uh, uh, standard uh, ways of uh, standard measurements so anything uh, the larger than 3 cm small bowel is dilated similarly for large bowel it is uh, 6 cm and more and cecum and sigmoid uh, cecum especially it can be normally up to 7 to 8 cm in diameter and anything above 9 cm uh, is uh, dilated so 3 6 9 rule easy to remember so these are the things that we need to see in barium interpretation yeah coming to the next part that is lesions lesions per se right so what are the different lesions that we come across one is 
there are two types basically the protrusions and the depressions the protrusions are uh, uh, something like polypoidal mass lesions right or uh, physiologically they can be just folds which are protruding into the lumen of the uh, bowel that we are talking about and depressions are ulcers and diverticulae which are projecting away from the lumen so with uh, towards lumen are protrusions and depressions are away from the lumen the direction basically so we'll just see what it could be so here comes another thing that we need to know what is a n phase view and a profile view so any lesion better to characterize as seen on an n phase and a profile view there are two types okay so what is an n phase view n phase view is when we see the lesion from the front okay or from the back it's a ap or a pa projection of the lesion that is an n phase view as the lesion is seen from the front and when it comes when a profile view is as it is seen uh, tangentially or lateral view it's something like a lateral view of the lesion so uh, we need to see in both the uh, direct uh, ways right to characterize the lesion as uh, what what is the type of ulcer or a diverticular polyp so it's very important similarly uh, this one uh, so what we can see here is the rectum right it's barium enema there is a barium pool uh, it's a ap view supine projection so the barium pool is in the posterior wall and there is a filling defect in the posterior wall right so a lesion a polypoidal lesion or a mass lesion will form a filling defect i'm talking about a protrusion a protrusion or a mass lesion or a polypoidal lesion on a dependent surface will cause what we call as yeah filling defect in the barium pool so that is very important to identify okay otherwise anyone can mistake it to an ulcer on a non dependent one and all that stuff so we have to uh, identify the which uh, whether it is a dependent or a non dependent surface so there is a barium pool and there is a filling defect here the same lesion once the patient is turned right to prone position we can see the barium pool here so now the barium pool is anterior because the patient is in prone position so the barium pool has gone anterior and this particular area that we are seeing this is the ulcer that was there correct now how to identify this etched with barium right it's uh, the rim is slightly white correct so the non dependent mass lesions or polypoidal lesions will have a stain of barium rather than uh, uh, appearing as a filling defect they will appear as a staining of barium if they are in a non dependent so it is better to assess both in dependent and non dependent locations every lesion like uh, taking the first supine and then going to the prone so this is very important to identify yeah what is this again another easy one so this is uh, again a double contrast barium uh, a barium uh, meal image of the stomach yeah it's correct these are after ulcers where all can we see after ulcers in the git yeah the first one is just some uh, stomach ulcers gastric ulcers gastric after ulcers are very common right you so they are very basically what it means is they are superficial in location so there is a barium pool again the barium pool will only be caused if they are in the dependent location right so very important to notice that dependent location they will be filled with barium non dependent they will be just etched with barium so that's the difference and surrounding the barium uh, pool or the crater centrally there is a halo around them so that is just edema the raised mucosa which has displaced the barium all around it so it is not stained with barium so that is how to identify and there are multiple ulcers here as uh, rightly suggested uh, it is also seen in crohn's disease right early stages of crohn's disease in the distal ileum so uh, that is where we see the after ulcers again what is this yeah this again a barium meal study so what is happening here is 
this is the lesser curvature this is the lesser curvature correct and there is a filling defect here there is a filling defect here and there is a barium pool in the center actually this is a lateral view of the ulcer there is an ulcer on the lesser curvature correct and if this is a profile view of the ulcer so the ulcer is this okay so this is the ulcer as we can see the ulcer is actually within the expected uh, contour of the stomach correct it is not gone beyond it it is within the expected location uh, contour of the stomach within the expected contour of the stomach so but what is happening there is and you, if you see carefully this is more convex towards the lumen right convex this is the lumen so this is more convex towards the lumen and it is within the expected location of the uh, uh, contour of the stomach it is not gone beyond it so uh, now what does that mean so there is something called tarman's meniscus so what is the meniscus so uh, the, uh, there are many signs for it uh, you must have all read about it there is something called a tarman meniscus sign there is something called a kirkling's complex right so uh, here uh, the convexity towards the lumen is what is described as Carmen's meniscus sign. Okay, and uh, I have one thing to say here. Though it is seen in all malignancies, it is not very specific for a malignancy. It can be seen in some uh, benign conditions also. But uh, at, at the residency level, if anyone asks what is a Carmen's meniscus, you can always say it is a uh, indicator of malignancy, in, right? Malignant ulcer. Carmen's meniscus is nothing but the convexity towards the lumen. Right? If it is a benign ulcer, it will be concavity towards the lumen. It will be something like this. And there is again, if you notice, there is a filling defect here. Right? There is a halo here, much internally. Right? So what is this? So this is what we call as both the convexity and this is a this is basically uh, Carmen's meniscus sign is seen especially when we do a compression of the stomach okay so the compression it's a comp in the compression view we can see this uh, meniscus sign otherwise we will not be able to do it so this is when we have done a compression the two surfaces of the uh, ulcer which are nodular right the maybe the anterior and the posterior ma margins of the ulcer which are more nodular and there is a thickened mucosa so they have approximated each other and that appears as a filling defect here. So both together with the, this convexity towards the lumen and this filling defect, both together are called circling's complex. So it's as simple as that, fine? So, and it is, we can see it's very irregular in shape, uh, the ulcer as such, and some folds are there, which are not that characteristic though. So what we need to understand here is that there is a Carmen's meniscus sign and there is a circling's complex. So both these are uh, usually associated with the stomach uh, malignant ulcer. And malignant ulcers are most common along the lesser curvature. Any, in fact, any ulcer is more common along the lesser curvature of stomach. So there is a lesion here, right? This is a lesion I'm talking about. Again, this is a barium swallow. There is a small lesion and this one is outpouching from the contour. So the, it is outside the contour of the stomach and there is a small line here right so this is how a benign ulcer will appear so this is another this is an example of a benign ulcer which will which will be outside the contour of the which will extend outside the contour of the stomach correct very smooth margins right and there is a small thin line which may or may not be seen all the time and this is just overhanging mucosa also called a hampton's line so this is how a benign ulcer will appear so just remember this how to differentiate a benign and a malignant uh, another way of differentiating ulcers benign and malignant especially in stomach are to see the folds so there are mucosal folds which will run to the ulcer margins right so if they are all touching the ulcer margins, they are very thin, regular, radiating from all directions, very thin, right, uniform in size, and reaching the ulcer margins, they are benign, it's of benign nature, correct? And if it is, if the folds are thicker, right, nodular, irregular, we can't even make out what's happening, nodular folds, right, or nodular folds, and they may not reach 
the ulcer margins they are they will be much shorter of ulcer margins so these are how to uh, differentiate a benign and malignant ulcers again so uh, this is how a this is the graphical depiction of a benign gastric ulcer this is the lumen of the stomach correct and this is the ulcer per se so the ulcer so ulcer is beyond the contour of the stomach as i told this is called the ulcer crater okay this part so some mucosa there is erymatous mucosa and all so this is this is called the mold okay it's mold or the collar mold is nothing but deep cup mucosa erymatous mucosa if if it is smooth if it is nodular and irregular mold then it is malignant so here it is smooth mold and uh, this is also called the collar collar is the entry or the neck of the ulcer so neck of the ulcer and there is a small mucosal overhanging margin here which is called the hampton's line and there may or may not be a cleft underneath so that's not uh, important so what we need to know is there is something called ulcer crater there is something called ulcer mound ulcer collar hampton's line and if it is malignant there is a circling complex and a meniscus sign so these are the things that we need to know uh, just to differentiate benign and malignant ulcers uh, so benign are projecting outside the lumen i mean the contour of the lumen and they are endoluminal they are smooth rounded and the ulcer is usually deep they are shallow ulcers irregular uh, smooth ulcer mound nodular ulcer mound the heaped up mucosa that i was talking about the smooth gastric folds that reach the margin nodular gastric folds that do not reach the ulcer margin hampton's line benign and carmen's meniscus sign in the malignant ulcers yeah there are three images of the esophagus again so can you just try to tell the diagnosis anyone can take a guess just type in the chat box these are just examples i'm quoting will have a much in the much detail web classes in uh, future this is just an overview just to present what all things we have to see okay so i'm not going to deal with each and every pathology uh, in uh, today's class yeah the first one as we can see uh, the difference is there is narrowing of the there is a long segment narrowing of the esophagus correct what is important to know it is it is a gradual tapering correct gradual tapering and a long narrowing there are some ulcerations at the lower part of the esophagus so it could be just a reflux esophagitis that we are talking about the second one just see it's not gradual there is a sudden change in caliber correct so there is a shelf like projection here and very regular uh, margins of the esophagus so this is a malignancy and the third one again is a benign nature long segment this was actually a case of uh, uh, right is a chemical esophagitis or a lice picture that we talk long segment so the first and third are pretty much the same this is to differentiate a benign structure from a malignant okay very irregular and a sudden change in caliber shelf like projection or something called shouldering okay so this is again we need to identify any external compressions uh, so what is happening here normal abnormal so obviously if you have put up a image that should be uh, abnormal i guess right yeah correct so yeah this phage here loose here is the correct answer and uh, in this particular thing we should know uh, the importance of these images or we have to know what are the normal indentations or impressions on the lumen especially the esophagus right uh, for, as far as esophagus is uh, con uh, concerned there are at least four uh, different uh, normal indentations that we come across external indentation the indentation from the aorta the left main bronchus the cardia and the at the g junction so it's very important to know those indentations and other than that if there is anything extra then it is abnormal like for this case uh, this is almost at the uh, aorta right arch of aorta but what is happening is there is also posterior indentation so this was a case so this is a case of uh, aberrant right subclavian artery as rightly uh, told by all of you so we need to again anatomy is very important and to identify uh, whether it, it is 
intraluminal or extraluminal is again one more thing. So I'll discuss it later again in the next subsequent slides. And this is again straightforward a case of barium swallow, right? So always when you do a barium study, just don't concentrate on the lumen, concentrate on the adjacent parts also. Now here the pre-vertebral soft tissues, very much thick hands or foci of air. So there was an abscess in the pre-vertebral which was actually causing the indentation. Yeah, so that is very important to not to just look at the lumen, but also at the same structures also. What is this? Again, a spotter and the easiest spotter of all. Yeah, this is a cricopharyngeal web. Specifically, there is some, the esophageal webs are a different location. So you have to tell it as a cricopharyngeal web. It's a shelf-like projection, which causes a fill, shelf-like filling defect from the anterior margin. Similarly, if it is on the posterior, there can be uh, osteophytes or uh, vascular loops and all that stuff. So we should know uh, what are the different uh, indentations or uh, uh, filling defects that can come uh, in what location. So this is at the location of C6, so we have to call it pharyngeal verb. So those were about the ulcers and external impressions and all that stuff. Uh, now let us just try to analyze uh, how to differentiate uh, a polyp and an ulcer. So this is a very classical image. I have directly taken it from Goran Levine. So beautiful image I have never got in my life in any of the barium studies. So I have just taken it from Goran Levine. And uh, so this is something called bowler's hat sign. So this is to differentiate a polyp from the ulcer, a diverticular, sorry, polyp from a diverticular, okay? So the polyp usually will be like this, projecting into the lumen from the mucosa, right? That will be a polyp. So the dome of the hat will be towards the lumen. And if the dome is out towards outside, uh, towards uh, exterior, it is a diverticular, as simple as that, right? So some great person has labeled it as a bowler's hat sign to differentiate a diverticulum from a polyp. Similarly, there is another uh, sign, even this is from Gore and Levine. So there is something called Mexican hat sign. So the bowler hat sign was actually a profile view, the lateral view of the lesion, okay? Mexican hat sign is an end phase view as if we are seeing it from the front. So Mexican hat sign depicts there is a polyp inside basically, correct? So the polyp seen end phase. So the larger circle represents the, the polyp itself and the smaller one is the neck of the polyp, the stalk of the polyp, okay? This is the head of the polyp and this is the stalk of the polyp. So we need to know that such things exist and uh, yeah, definitely polyp lesions, uh, if we do a very good uh, double contrast study, we will come, uh, we will just get these myths. Uh, another case would be anything. Yeah, any guesses what this could be? Viruses, okay. Pseudodiverticulosis, okay. Chemical, fine. So pseudodiverticulosis is as close as possible, I guess. Yeah, this is a candidiasis. This is the candidiasis. So what is important is it's very irregular filling defects, right? right? Nodular filling defects are there, very irregular. And uh, uh, what we can see, even the margins are not regular, correct? Smooth. Uh, so this is a case of uh, candida. So this is this irregularity and shabby appearance. Actually, they call it shaggy esophagitis or a shaggy esophagus, which seen in the later phases of candida esophagitis. Initially, there are only ulcers, right? Small ulcers and gradually develop into other things. So what is hap uh, ha what happens in candida is there are actually not ulcers, there are plaques. Okay, there are plaques. Plaques are slightly elevated lesions. There are multiple plaques and uh, in candida esophagitis, what happens is there are barium precipitates. The barium, when you swallow, the, there are precipitation of barium, and there are uh, in between the plaques, it gets uh, uh, accumulated and all that stuff. So these are not actually diverticulate outside. These are within the lumen, so they are giving a pseudo diverticular appearance because uh, there are flakes of barium uh, with, in between plaques. So very difficult to identify, but uh, this appearance is classical. So very shaggy appearance, shabby appearance. The later stages of Canada is a page like this. Again, a straightforward case uh, to deal with, uh, to tell just about again how a malignant ulcer appears. 
malignant lesion. This is a transverse colon or barium enema. And uh, what is important to know it is the, the irregularity of a filling defect causing luminal narrowing in the transverse colon, right? And again, the shouldering sign, okay? The sudden change in caliber, the shouldering sign, uh, the shoulder sign. So that is that makes it malignant, right? Irregular shape, irregular narrowing, and shoulder. So these are the three ways of telling that it is a malignancy. And this is another classical, the apple core deformity uh, in the ascending colon. Only a thin stream of barium is seen. There's again that shoulder, correct? Shoulder is uh, a classical of malignancy. What is this shouldering? So if it is a benign, there is a gradual tapering like this. And if it is malignant lesion, there is an irregular eccentric uh, filling defect usually and the proximal and wherever you have uh, given a barium from if it is a barium enema the distal end will be more shoulder again uh, uh, diverticula to so identify diverticula appear differently whether if they are in a dependent position and uh, differently if they are non-dependent independent obviously the diverticula will be filled with barium and non-dependent uh, uh, they will be etched with barium again. Okay, so remember that we have to try and identify based on this. So this is the uh, different types of diverticula, different locations. So we should know that something called Zenkel's diverticulum is there, the posterior part at the level of the cricopharynx, right? So the classically called Zenkel's diverticulum. What is this? Any guesses? What is this? Yeah, correct. So this is Killiam Jamison's diverticle. Again, at the level of cricopharynx, we you should have identified the right, the valiculi and all that stuff. So cricopharynx, the lateral diverticular are called Killian Jamison diverticulate. Yeah, and till now we talked about different types of lesions, the mass lesion, the ulcers, the diverticular. Now let's try and focus about different types of mucosal patterns that we come across, right? Uh, villa classical villus pattern that we see in the small bowel loops They're nothing but they are uh, small villus folds in between which the barium is uh, uh, getting accumulated and this is how a villus pattern appears right so there are small indentations and uh, barium loops so alternate areas of uh, lucency and barium filled into spaces between the villi and uh, the very thin uh, in nature so this is what these lines so this is what we need to know so this is what is called villus pattern of small intestines next we come to something called reticular pattern right where are reticular pattern uh, basically where where is it seen reticular pattern uh, the reticular pattern is only indicates that there is some columnar cells there so it's very important so anywhere you find columnar cells you may actually see the reticular pattern more commonly seen in something called area gastracea of the stomach, correct? Yeah, Barrett's, whenever there is a columnar metaplasia in the distal esophagus, again, reticular pattern appears. As I told initially, esophagus is either featureless or have only longitudinal folds. And very, very time, few times you can see transverse folds, especially in the upper esophagus. But when you start seeing these type of reticular pattern in the esophagus, start thinking oh, this is that is Barrett's, okay? So columnar, basically there are islands of columnar cells and there is a gap between these islands. So wherever there is columnar cells, so they, that is where the barium fills in and gives rise to reticular pattern, uh, usually seen in the stomach antrum, right? Also in uh, uh, the Barrett's esophagus. Again, the stomach here, we are able to see this, that same reticular pattern in the for antrum and pylorus. Also, we see the longitudinal rugae, right, in the proximal part. So, this is the normal appearance again. So, there can be longitudinal rugae also, and there can be reticular pattern. So, more reticular pattern is also dangerous. So, many people have uh, 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 associated it with the H. pylori infection and all that stuff. So, reticular pattern, uh, uh, though it is seen in uh, area, the antrum of the stomach. Uh, it should not be seen uh, in uh, uh, more prominently in other places of the stomach also, right? 
So again, uh, the normal appearance of esophagus is depicted in this. So we can see the longitudinal folds. Sorry, sorry for the. We can see the longitudinal folds in the middle uh, image. Correct. So and we can also we are seeing some transverse folds. So the longitudinal folds are normal, and uh, it can appear featureless as in the first image also normal appearance. This is a mucosal relief film with longitudinal folds, and there can be transverse uh, folds also because of contraction of the uh, muscularis propriae. So even that is normal. Uh, though labeled as feline esophagus and all that stuff, but again, it is a normal uh, variant. So we should be aware that these are the normal appearances, right? But when we actually start seeing this nodularity, right? Not typical reticular pattern here. There are some nodular pattern, right? Nodules with filling defect and all that stuff. So, that longitudinal rugae are uh, not seen uh, very obviously and it is not featureless and neither the transverse folds are seen, but we are actually seeing something different in the distal esophagus. So this is a reflux esophagitis going into Barrett's, right? So that is how we can differentiate with, with what is normal and what's abnormal. Again, another pattern that is that we come across is granular pattern. So you can see granules, uh, reticular pattern it was like mesh mesh work right granules you can have focal uh, filling defects focal filling defects right alternatively there are some barium filled spaces in between so this is what is called granular pattern usually seen in ulcerative colitis right or wherever there are uh, uh, it can also be seen in Crohn's disease uh, basically uh, it means there are some elevations or granules that are developing in the mucosa it's usually uh, whenever we see granular pattern it is mostly abnormal so that is what we need to understand so in Crohn's disease uh, initially we told there will be aphthous ulcers right superficial ulcers uh, gradually they penetrate deep and then they form what is called cobblestoning right cobblestoning again are a uh, few elevated areas and in between uh, uh, these the, in, there are interstices which are uh, occupied by the uh, barium. So this is what is cobblestoning that we see in uh, a later stages of Crohn's disease. So we should know something like this also exists, this pattern. Uh, now coming to the var varices, right? Varices, important is the longitudinal folds are seen, but they are serpentine in the esophagus, right? They are serpentine lesions. And you can see that contours are pretty normal, smooth, serpentine appearance of the longitudinal folds, dilated, thickened and serpentine. So that is when we actually start uh, calling it the esophageal viruses. So just uh, to tell, this is a stacked coin appearance or a picket fence, both are one and the same. Uh, what it means is thickened folds, mucosal folds in the small bowel, okay? It's basically this terminology is reserved for small bowel fold thickening, villus thickening. So thickened and in between, you can see the distance between the two uh, barium filled interstices is larger, but they are uniform, almost uniform throughout. So these are thickened villi and barium in between. So, and they are very straight columns, right? They are very regularly spaced and very straight columns of uh, thickened villi. So that is what uh, has been uh, depicted as picket fence or a stack of coin appearance. And it is usually seen again in uh, wherever there is a submucosal edema or hemorrhage. So we can see it right from ischemic colitis to other conditions. Uh, so very closely, uh, the picket fence and uh, this is something called hide bound appearance. So hide bound appearance and picket fence are very close if you see. The difference is in hide bound appearance, there is no thickening. Actually, it is only a hide bound uh, uh, seen as zero dermal through. There is no thickening of the folds. In fact, there is atrophy. There is atrophy of the mucosa, uh, sorry, muscularis. So the, there is fibrosis. There is fibrosis. So the folds are actually very closely spla uh, spaced, placed to each other. Correct? There is no thickening of the villi. So what is this hide bound? Any guesses? What exactly does this hide bound? What is this hide bound? Why why are you calling it hide bound?
Now, hide bound is basically uh, a malnourished animal or something where we cannot uh, separate the skin from the bones. That's what it's called. Okay, it is bound by the skin, and there are no much mu mu muscular layer in between. So basically, it's a terminology for animals that is used. What it means, you cannot stretch it. So, uh, so in this also, it's the same. So very closely spaced. So the density of the folds are very much high. And the villas are not edematous. That's what it means when we call uh, uh, height bond appearance. Next, this is what? Large bowel hostile thickening. So this is a large bowel. In this, there are hosta and they are thickened. And when this, is, this uh, occurs, we call it a finger thumb printing or a finger printing, thumb printing sign, right? Again, seen in ischemic colitis. So there is another terminology, though it looks like very reticular pattern and all that stuff, uh, they call it the carpet lesion. So the carpet lesion usually is described in tubulovillus adenomas. They are all filling defects. All these are adenomas, multiple adenomas, right? Filling defects and uh, turning into malignancy because of the irregularity that is seen here. So there is a terminology called carpet lesion also. So what is this? Till now we discussed uh, many lesions which are malignant. This is just an indication. This is a lesion which is totally benign. Okay, there is a smooth filling defect. Yes, perfect. The very, very smooth filling defect here. And what we can make out is that it is forming a very acute angle with the bowel wall. Okay, so it is in the within the wall of the uh, lumen. Okay, so it's a benign condition which is there within the wall of the uh, bowel. So what we have to understand here is it's not malignant. There is no irregularity here. So this is how we can differentiate uh, three types of uh, lesions in the bowel related to the bowel. One is intraluminal, this one is intramural, and the third one is extrinsic compression. Intraluminal, there may be slight widening of the lumen, but the bowel wall is relatively okay, and it again uh, forms an acute angle. And there will be actually dilatation of the lumen. And uh, if it is uh, from the in, it's intramural within the wall, it, it forms an acute angle with the wall. Okay, it's this acute angle with the wall. Again, the, there is no gross dilatation of the lumen. In fact, if you to take two tangential views, uh, the lumen may appear stretched in one of um, the perpendicular view. Okay, and extrinsic compression forms an obtuse angle. So this is how, and there is more. Uh, displacement of the lumen when if it is an extrinsic compression when compared to the intramural intramural will not cause um, displacement of the wall as much as an extrinsic compression does so just to differentiate different types of lesions uh, so uh, this is what i thought i'll just try and cover by uh, giving uh, just an overview of different type of lesions i am sure many of you already know about the, um, many of these things but i thought it is very useful especially for the first years and uh, hope it was a useful class uh, this is the last slide of mine and we will definitely have much many many more classes on individual we will try and have uh, many more classes on individual parts of the GIT right from Mr. Vegas to Colon. Uh, I hope it was useful to everyone that's what I just hope okay our uh, our intention is to ensure that uh, we are of some use uh, in your uh, uh, becoming a good radiologist that's all uh, any feedback kindly uh, mail me you can just message me on my number it's there on the screen right so and again at the end i just again thank uh, dr saida and dr mega for helping me out uh, in preparing this uh, powerpoint presentation and uh, uh, some of the images are my own and uh, all of the uh, my collections are uh, most of them i have taken it from goran levine so one thing I'll tell you here is, uh, if you have if you have a soft copy of a Goran Levine or if you have a hard copy of it in your libraries or your home, uh, just going through the images and the legends underneath will help you in your uh, uh, gaining knowledge on barium. Just see the image and see the legend. Okay, there are so many images in that book, and I'm a big fan of that book. So that's a small tip uh, which may be helpful to you people. And uh, thank you so much. Just give your feedback on the mail or the SMS or in the WhatsApp group so that uh, we can continue our efforts, right? 
so the next class will be 15 days from now and we'll just shortly announce the topic right and uh, thank you so much so we'll continue this fortnightly efforts till then okay thank you one and all any feedbacks you can just type in the chat box